Hello and welcome to this FMB webinar on the all important topic of health and safety. Um, my name is Hayley and I work for the FMB and whether this is your first webinar with us or you're a, um, an old friend of the FMB, then you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, before I introduce today's topic, I'd just like to say that we are at the moment just planning our webinar series for later this year. So if you can think of any topics that you would like the FMB to cover in a webinar format or a speaker that you've seen elsewhere that you'd like to suggest to us to invite along to a webinar, then please let us know about that. Um, we always send out a follow up email after the webinars. So you can just reply to that with any thoughts you've got on that. Um, I'll put my contact details in there as well. So you could give me a call if you prefer to discuss. So um, back to today's webinar, health and safety. If you've ever spoken to um, a builder or anybody involved with our industry who's been involved in a, an accident, a serious accident or a fatality on site, then you'll know about the massive impact that that can have on all involved. In fact, I, just by coincidence, I was talking to someone earlier today who was telling me about a family member of theirs who was involved in a serious accident on site where a wall collapsed on them. And not only did that have massive consequences for them and their family, obviously, and, and uh, that person's now having their 15th surgical procedure done as a result of that accident. Um, also, the 17 year old apprentice who tried to dig him out from under the wall by removing the bricks is now suffering from PTSD as a result of that experience, which I can quite understand. So, and, and that accident was avoidable um, as most accidents it seems are. So it's all very well for me to sit here in my office at my nice safe desk talking about health and safety, but what's the view from the building site? Um, what's the practicalities of implementing best practice on site? And what are the main dangers faced in the building industry? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, We've got Andy and John from the Building Safety Group who know about these topics and are going to speak to you about uh, health and safety today. If you have any questions as we're going through the presentation, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you just hover your mouse down there, you should be able to see that. You can type the question in there and we'll deal with those at the end of the presentation. So before I hand over, first of all, to Andy Harper from uh, BSG, I'm just going to ask John, also from the Building Safety Group, to say a little bit about the um, risk assessment and method, st st method statement software <coughs> that the BSG have produced and that we make available to our members. So, John, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that um, whilst I recover from my coughing fit, that would be great. <laughs> Thank of you. Of course. Thank you, Hayley, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so Safety Plus um, gives FMB members access to some risk assessment and method statement software, which uh, we developed. Um, it's been um, developed by our construction safety experts, and it's specifically for uh, building and construction companies. It's designed to be very functional and very easy to use, and also for use sort of on the hoof via a mobile app that's available. Um, and with the software, you get access to a unique library of templates uh, that cover an awful lot of the hazards that you'll be coming across and dealing with on busy building and construction sites on a day to day basis. Um, the software is also supported with access to a dedicated helpline that provides advice, guidance and support where that's needed as and when you're completing uh, risk assessments or method statements. Um, and if anyone would like to know more or see a demo of the software, Please just let us know. We'd be happy to uh, set something up after the webinar. Brilliant. Thank you, John. And again, people can just reply to the email that we'll send out afterwards. Or if people are watching this on catch up, actually, we can attach the uh, contact details to the presentation and to the video so that people can get in touch. And as well as that helpline to help members using the software, um, the FMB also has a specialist construction health and safety advice line as well, 
we'll put the contact number for that in the follow-up email also. And that's another valuable service that members can access. And you don't have to have a massive problem to call that service. You can just um, call them for a second opinion on something or to run ideas by them. So that's um, really helpful as well. We get good feedback on that. So um, without further ado, I think uh, we should hand over to Andy to run through his presentation. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Hayley. So, um, next slide, please. My uh, introduction, if you like, for BSG uh, and myself is uh, I'm a uh, um, charter member of IOSH um, and I've worked for BSG now for 16 years. But before that, I was, I've was i been involved in construction all my working life. Uh, my father was a, a member of the, uh, the FMV back in the 70s. So... I understand what uh, small to medium sized builders struggle with all day, every day. Um, so who is BSG? Next slide, please. Um, BSG are a membership organization. Um, our, our mission is, as it says on the slide, uh, one of the UK's largest construction safety groups over 50 years experience of providing specialist consultancy, and we are specialists. Uh, we conduct over 15,000 site inspections per year, uh, UK wide, uh, experts in construction, health and safety, environmental welfare, and unique, unique insight into the construction sector. My role within BSG is to liaise with the HSE, field inspectors and construction inspectors who are out there visiting sites um, as the regulator. Next slide, please. Uh, we are not for profit organization, but we operate on a commercial basis, but we're not for pro no profit motive, focusing entirely on quality to ensure we deliver the highest standards in health and safety. We're owned by the members, run by the members for the benefit of the members and all our uh, board of directors listed below are managing directors or directors of building con uh, uh, member companies or building contractors. Ethical, practical, consistent and transparent are our watchwords. Next slide, please. People we look after, house builders, principal contractors, contractors and subcontractors, civil engineers, ground workers, designers and architects, which we support with the CDM process, um, ME contractors, plasterers, dry liners, electricians. We do support a number of housing associations in their various new build uh, endeavors and also uh, reactive maintenance, painting contractors, scaffolders, amongst others. Okay, next slide, please. So. What we're going to try and cover today, very briefly, is our top five issues we see at BSG on sites, which are working at height. Um, working at height, we have we last year we had um, 123 fatalities at work, uh, 30 of them in construction, but overall there were 29 people killed uh, whilst at work falling from height. So working at height is a major issue, and if I was a betting man. The majority of people have as a, as, a, as a real hazard within their working environment, working at height. Edge protection goes hand in hand with working at height. Um, if you get the edge protection wrong, chances are somebody's going to fall off. Uh, dust, construction dust has been identified as a major occupational hazard for everyone on construction sites. Um, we'll go into that in a little bit more depth. Housekeeping. Uh, material storage, many serious slips and trips and injuries from falling materials uh, or stored materials. We'll go into that. Acts investigations undertaken by BSG show a lack, a real lack in adequate um, risk assessment. Next slide, please. So this first example is a true, obviously the examples I'm gonna give are true examples and we've taken this from prosecutions that the HSE have delivered and, and various different outlets. So working at height, on the 15th of January, um, up in Cambridgeshire, a builder was fined 16,000 pound after pleading guilty to breaching regulation eight of the working height regulations following an incident that saw one of its workers fall from height and subsequently die. This is the actual scene. And the guy was working on the, the, the tower scaffold platform on the steel areas above and fell from there 
and subsequently died. Um, next slide, please. Culpability. The HSC investigation concluded that the builder hadn't got its selection, hadn't got his, its selection of adequate uh, access equipment right, or if they did, they hadn't used it properly. Due to the company's small size, the potential fine was set at a starting point of £30,000. But because the, uh, the, the, the small family owned nature of the company and the seriousness with which its management reacted to the incident saw that the fine being reduced significantly. You'll find that the, 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 uh, the majority of prosecutions will be uh, the starting sets for, for sentencing the guidelines for fines, etc., are preset and you can either, they'll either go down or they'll go up. So this is another example working on a fragile roof uh, in July of last year, Redditch, Red, uh, Redditch Magistrates Court said to say roofing boss to four months in prison after uh, in prison after pleading guilty to breaches included under the working at height regulations. The case uh, uh, came about after a labourer worked on a fragile roof and fell into a concrete floor, sustaining life-changing injuries. Next slide, please. The sentencing guidelines changed in February 2016. Prior to that, you had, you had to have had a breach of a prohibition notice to be sent to prison. What's happened now is that almost all health and safety offences potentially have a custodial sentence attached to them where individuals, where individuals are prosecuted. Um, as far as the uh, um, uh, uh, working on a fragile roof, one of the areas where the, which was within the prosecution was the example that they did not follow industry best practice. There is some superb guidance out there um, issued by uh, ACR, which is the Advisory Committee for Roof Safety. And they are really good. They're, they're, it covers various different areas, including working on fragile roofs. And part of the prosecution example, the HSE said that they didn't follow industry best practice. And the, uh, uh, for example, they used that, that particular, those particular documents provided. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, scaffolding and edge protection. This particular uh, scaffolding example was a fatality. Next slide, please. A roofer and scaffolder have been prosecuted over a fatal fall from the roof of a two-story terraced house. They did not put simple preventative measures in place to avoid the incident. The roofers were working on the property roof in Southwest London when the incident happened. Whilst carrying the slates up, uh, one of the roofers fell around six meters through a gap, which was adjacent to the hoist and landed on the, on the ground. He died almost in, immediately. We could go back one slide. You can see there the gap at the top where the ladder axis. We see this on many, many scaffolding uh, arrangements on residential houses where for whichever reason, there's a gap there and the ladder axis is provided by the roofing contractor and the scaffolder leaves that as it is. Next slide, please. And the next one, that's it. The HSE found that when the scaffolder erected the scaffold, he'd left a 1.17, uh, sorry, 1.17 gap in the edge protection at ladder access point and did not fit a, a scaffold gate. The scaffolder was not fully qualified to erect the scaffold and the investigation also found that the equipment did not comply with industry standards nor legal requirements. Next slide, please. The roofing contractor pleaded guilty to breaching section three of the Health and Safety Work Act and at Southwark Crown Court, and he was fined five thousand uh, pounds in order to, to pay costs of six thousand three hundred and eighteen. The scaffold contractor was also pleaded guilty to breaching section three of the Health and Safety Work Act and was fined the same amount uh, and handed the same costs. It's a requirement of all scaffolds. Uh, under the working at height regulations that they, they uh, assemble to a generally recognized standard. Now, 
Often it will be the NASC uh, technical guidance TG20, which is now TG2021, which meets a, which is a set standard, or manufacturer's instructions if you're using a, um, a system scaffold. But it still must meet it. So any scaffold contractor working out there must work to one of one or two of those things. If not, they must they must be working to a a design by a scaffold designer. Um, anybody not not doing this and providing that are failing, but the requirements under uh, under the scaffolding arrangements are that you will be the end user, and therefore, what uh, what is uh, what remains as a scaffold must be adequate for you to use. Next slide, please. The HSC investigating said preventative measures were inexpensive and required little time or effort. Reducing the size of the opening to the, in the guardrails and installing a self-closing scaffold gate would have stopped this man from falling to his death. A scaffold gate costs around £40 and only takes a few minutes to install. Those involved in scaffolding and roof work on smaller sites needs to be, need, need to be aware of the potentially devastating consequences of falling to put basic safeguards in place. Once the scaffold is handed over, it is, it is the end user user's responsibility. Um, there are various different uh, guidance documents available by the HSE on what to do and checks that should be made on scaffold and scaffolding contractors in general. Next slide, please. Dust. So silicosis. Silicosis is the, uh, the inhalation of dust created by cutting stone or concrete products can lead to silicosis. Um, it can also lead to other diseases, COPD. Um, the main part of, of uh, concrete dust, for example, or stone dust, for example, are, is uh, respiratory crystalline silica. This can affect your lungs and cause chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, um, which, which is a, uh, um, causes airflow blockage and breathing related problems. I have a, a, a builder who I support in the Southampton area. And when approaching the site office where he's working, you can often hear him breathing um, because his COPD is so bad. Um, that is a lifetime lifetime's exposure of uh, to uh, exposure to um, concrete and stone dust and uh, other construction related dusts. Next slide, please. This unfortunately is what what, the, what your lungs look like after when affected by silicosis. Um, it can be the agony of living with it is 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 much more uh, appropriate to what uh, the, the, the suffering that people go through. Um, next slide, please. Housekeeping. Um, we talk about housekeeping in a way where it sounds uh, a little bit of a, not, not, not something we wanna focus on, but we must provide a safe way of approaching and leaving the place of, safe, the place of work. We talk about good order, storage areas and uh, uh, waste materials. Um, but something as simple as a slip and, uh, slip or trip is the single largest cause of injuries on construction sites, leading to around a thousand um, major injuries per year. We talk about people don't think it's a big deal, but on construction sites it can be. Um, there is a, a really good guidance document from the HSE for all builders, which is free to download which is HSG 150, available on the HSC website. Um, and it's free to download, and I recommend anybody give it a good look, good, good look at. Next slide, please. Stored materials, major problem for us in construction. Materials delivered to sites, um, which um, are pal uh, palletized or packaged often they are, the, the band is broken to get some of the material away. As soon as we do that, the load becomes unstable and therefore great care should be taken. Um, 
there is guidance in 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 uh, HSG one five zero, which stipulates that pallets should be rebanded and reassembled if possible before being moved, and certainly where they're stored, made safe. I'm not sure in this particular photo uh, where the uh, the gates are and the necessary scaffolding protection to protect from that material from cutting off that scaffold. Okay, next slide, please. So, assessment of risk. Where are the hazards? The management of health and safety at work regulations require employers to assess the risk of activities, introduce measures to control those risks and tell their employees about these measures. BSG investigates many accidents each year and far too many are the result of the hazard not being identified or the lack of control. Risk assessment provide the fundamental intelligence on the hazard risks and precautions on carrying out an activity. It is the serious hazard we're looking for um, and the, the, the measures or the controls which reduce that hazard to an acceptable level. We cannot take away all risk, but what we can do is reduce the hazard to an acceptable level that we can all live with. Uh, this must be done, and the best way of doing this is with a suitable risk assessment, because then we then got a record and um, we can make adjustments and inform people about what those controls will be. OK, next slide, please. Workplace dangers. It's important for employers to be able to spot potential dangers in and around the workplace. Please study these pictures and see if you can spot the dangers yourself. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I think this one is an American photo, but we'll, we'll, you get the gist of it. Next slide, please. And the next. So although we've, we've taken a, a, a lighter, a lighthearted approach to these hazards, we're looking for the serious hazards, the hazards that cause, that could cause real harm. Um, the main thing is, is that to identify the hazard is, is a key operation, but who might be harmed and how. Follow those simple principles and risk assessments then become easy. Next slide, please. So last but not least, um, I'm gonna ask to talk about the, the Building Safety Act. Um, Building Safety Act 2022, following the Grenfell, report and the, the inquiry. It received royal assent on the 28th of April last year and provides a new framework for the design, construction and occupation of high risk buildings. These are defined as having as those having at least 18 meters or seven stories in height and comprise of at least two domestic premises. The, the, the act itself is designed to enforce the building regulations. It also introduces a new duty holder, the account per, accountable person. Um, but the, because we haven't got any firm guidance um, available from the regulator or the government involving this act, and normally with all acts and, and especially with health and safety uh, uh, legislation and regulations, there are approved codes of practice or guidance documents issued by the, the regulator of the HSC. Our advice at this stage is to follow L153, which again, a HSC uh, downloadable guidance document, um, which um, is available free to download for the website because it talks about the same duty holders um, and it's very similar if working on high risk buildings. The person who designed CDM regulations 2015, uh, Judith Hackett, also uh, had a hand in the Building Safety uh, Act design. 
and use the same uh, key duty holders, which are client, principal designer, principal contractor, etc. So we would recommend that in the until we get firm uh, uh, decent guidance on this, to follow this. Uh, but don't forget that the Building Safety Act is only applicable to, to high, higher risk buildings, which are defined as those as uh, for having at least 18 metres or seven storeys in height and comprising of at least two domestic premises. OK, so it only applies to those particular high, higher risk buildings. OK. If you have any questions on any of this so far, um, let me know. Mm, thanks, Andy. So that's really clear on 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 that Building Safety Act piece. That's really helpful. I think. Um, do you th think, in your opinion, will it um, eventually become applicable to the whole of the building industry? No. no you think it's going to stay with the high high risk, high rise it's, buildings? It's it's it's, it's a high risk um, uh, model where we we are enforcing really and truly a, 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 an act to enforce the building regulations. Building regulations, you know, was, was sort of, was, was something which uh, you, you could or couldn't do. The enforcement was through building control, et cetera. Now we've got a, um, a, a, an act with a, 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 a separate regulator, which will be the agency, which is uh, the Building Safety Regulator, BSR, and we'll be staffed by HSE people, and they will enforce that. As yet, there's been no enforcement. Um, so, but that we're we're looking for proper uh, workable guidance in the shape of a an approved code of practice or something along some, along those sort of lines. We have them for all the other regulations and acts, and so we're looking for that before before I you know I, I would be able to sort of say to you. We just be reading the regulations, to be honest. Uh, the, the 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 actual part of the act where, you know, word for word. Until we get that, I would focus on your duties under CDM yes, first and yeah. foremost, and then go from there. Okay, thank you. Um, I it was remiss of me. I forgot at the beginning of this webinar to launch a poll for the audience. So, I might just do it now to check everybody's still paying attention. Mm. Um, which is asking you the question um, for, of those attending, have you ever experienced an accident or a near miss on a site you've been working on? So I might just leave that on the screen for a moment or two to give everybody a chance to um, respond to that. Okay. So I'll end that there. Well, but it's good news actually that most of the members attending have not experienced an accident or a near miss on a site. So that's good, but there's a significant number that have. So um, I guess that's why it's well worth them being at this webinar to get the extra input from yeah. Andy. So thank you everybody for that. We have got a couple of questions okay. as well. So uh the first one is about scaffolding so yeah. members asked if i ask a scaffolder to put up scaffolding for me when am i when do i become responsible for it the minute they start putting it out it's simple um as with all appointments um you're responsible for checking that the the, the contractor is competent so you've appointed the contractor under cdm you'll be responsible to um check their competency and if they're competent they should be okay to erect scaffolding before you're there often scaffolding on repair works etc is done in advance of the builder turning up to do the works if that happens you would expect them to take the, the basic safeguard measures right but you are liable to a degree whilst they're doing it because you have appointed them under cdm um once you once the scaffolding is up and hand it over, you are responsible for it as the end user. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier on some um, HSE uh, regulations or standards about scaffold direction, didn't you? I think that it's, we- it's, it's, it's actually the working at height regulations. 
It right, stipulates okay. that all scaffold must be must be uh, um, erected to a generally recognised standard. Um, the one favoured is the NASC uh, TG2021 compliance, which is an e-guide. So it's a computer programme where uh, you put in where the, 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 the scaffold contractor would put into a, a design where the, the, the scaffold is being built, what is required, how many lifts, how high it is, how wide it is, and all the various other little things. And then a set of a compliance notes are produced. If they don't do that, then it will require a scaffold design. But in both cases, you require something. The days okay. of the, the days of scaffolders erecting a scaffold, how they see fit, are no longer accepted. So perhaps we could find the link to that and post it with the uh, follow up email after it's the, the webinar. The, yeah, the the link itself is is probably the NASC link. Okay. Which we'll put up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody else has asked, can we get a demo of the risk assessment software that you mentioned at the beginning of the session? That's one for you, John, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, more than happy to do it. Um, if perhaps um, uh, you let us know who and when and what time and so on, we'll, we'll be more than happy to set them up and uh, run a Teams demo and show them the functionality and the library of templates that they have access to. I think there's something like 115, 120 templates within the software that will cater for a lot of the activities on site and will help to mitigate down some of the risks that uh, Andy's talked about today as well. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so Marta has asked, what's the name of the software? So I guess if you're an FMB member and you're accessing that service, it's um, FMB Safety Plus service, but it's provided to us by the guys from the Building Safety Group who've developed their risk assessment and methods of statement software. So we'll put the link to that in the recording into the uh, follow up email as well for you, Marta, so that you can access that easily. And we've had really good feedback from all the members who've used that, um, that service so far which is quite a substantial number of members several hundreds isn't it are now using it so we're pleased about that so ah i think another question has just popped into the box oh it's just marta saying thank you you're welcome marta <laughs> so um i think we'll wrap up there unless anybody uh, wants to pop a last minute question into the box right now while we're just winding up Otherwise, it just remains for me to say thank you very much to Andy and to John. I think this is such an important subject that we probably ought to cover it regularly. And um, one of the things I was thinking we could do is send the link to this session out to new members when they join the FNB, because we know that uh, that's a good time when they're receptive to getting information from us about this important topic. And also, uh, don't forget that in the follow up email, we will pop in. Um, the details of the Safety Plus product and also the helpline, the health and safety helpline and other resources that we may have referred to during the course of the webinar. Um, something that we've been reported from FMB Insurance Services from colleagues over there at the moment is that they're seeing because of the cost of living and the times that we're living through, people are looking to cut costs by um, reducing their insurance costs wherever they can. And sometimes we're finding that that means that people are underinsuring themselves, which is obviously quite a dangerous thing to do. Um, I'm sure you would advise against that, Andy, as well. So Definitely, if yeah. you would, yeah, our colleagues at FMB Insurance Services will happily have a conversation with any members about their insurance needs, even if you don't purchase your insurance through the FMB. So I'll pop their number in the email as well um, in case you want to give them a call and just make sure that your insurance needs are being adequately covered as well. And as I said at the at the beginning of the webinar, if you've got any thoughts about other topics that you'd like us to cover, um, just respond to the email that you'll get in the follow up after this event um, and let us know what those might be, because we're here to um, make lives easy, make our members lives easier at the end of the day. So anything that you've got a sort of burning question on your mind that you'd like us to cover, then please let us know. So we'll leave it there for today. And I'll just say thank you very much to Andy and John 
for being with us today and for your um, insight onto health and safety. And thank you to all the members for joining us. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>